Hello, my friends. It's so nice to see you tonight. This is Jeffrey Tucker from Liberty.me. I'm so glad you could join me here. Uh, tonight we're doing another episode of Liberty Classics and talking about great books in our tradition. Uh, this is a little bit of a strange night because um, actually I'm talking about a book by Henry Hazlitt. No, it is not Economics in One Lesson. Um, it's, it's a book that he wrote 25 years earlier, and it's not on economics as such, and it's not on politics as such. It's on self-improvement and um, individual psychology, lifestyle uh, issues. And he, but, you know, it has, I think he wrote it when he was about 22 years old or something. I think it appeared in 1922. Maybe he was a little bit older. Uh, and later he repudiated the book in embarrassment. He thought it was uh, beneath him. Actually, I think it's a wonderful book. Now, I have to caution you that I haven't read a lot of pop psychology, so I don't really know this literature that well. But I found tremendous insight in Hazlitt's uh, exposition, and I have a hard time believing that other, other authors uh, reached this level of sophistication that he, that he really did in his understanding of, of the human mind, uh, human decision-making and how to manage your life better. The name of the book is The Way to Willpower. I got it online. It's on Liberty Me. You can, you can download it. I got it online by, I think this was one of an occasion where I happened to uh, we borrow the book through interlibrary loan and got it from, yeah, you know, I don't know, some far-flung place and sent it over to the scanner, got it scanned. Of course, it's in the public domain, but uh, it wasn't online. It was hard to get, hard to find. I mean, this book didn't have a big printing. And like I say, Henry Hazlitt sort of more or less repudiated it. So it never got reprinted again, I don't think. I'm certain of that, actually. It never got reprinted again, which is too bad because it's actually a wonderful book. There's a strange way in which the book actually um, it follows the same model of economics in one lesson. Do you remember in, in economics in one lesson, he lays out economics. He says good economics consists of following not just the effects on one person, but on all people, on all groups, not just one group, but all groups, and not just in the short term, but long term. That's the, that's the lesson from Economics in One Lesson. In a weird way, he foreshadowed this model 25 years earlier by doing a similar model with um, individual psychology. He says that willpower consists not just of, de, of de making a choice in favor of, of one thing, but considering the opportunity costs of all the other things that you might otherwise have been doing. And, um, um, and shooting for goals, not just uh, the, the and, oh, and, and bringing into accord one's daily activities with your long-term goals. So not just the short-term, but the long-term. So in a, in a funny way, uh, this book is actually like a foreshadowing of economics one less than 25 years earlier you often find this with authors you know that that there's a certain cast of mind they had you know intellectual work is hard work right and 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 anybody who does it um brings their own particular talents and vision to to the project and we all have unique uh perspectives and, and points of views that that are that are all our own um and sometimes we carry them throughout the whole of our lives whether we're applying it to issues of um, you know, individual self-improvement or macroeconomics. I mean, the model still stays the same. I'm sure I would have loved for Hazlitt to be here for me to point this out to him. Like, did you know that you use basically the same structural uh, framework for understanding uh, 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 individual self-motivation and macroeconomics? He would have been amazed. <laughs> but that's sort of the way it is. That's the way it works with authors. But I find the book just delightful, really. Um, uh, because it speaks to something that actually matters in our lives. Uh, sometimes uh, libertarians get so obsessed with with what things look like in the big picture, what the state should do, uh, what society should look like, how the world should be structured. But we often forget to reflect on the fact that the biggest agent of change in the world and, and really the only one we can fully control is ourselves. Uh, we can't control what goes on in Washington. We can't control the structure of the social order, the, the, the nature of political economy, and 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 its functioning is beyond our 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 reach and our and our and our grasp. S um, we can't stop wars on our own. We can't um, make governments go away or adopt better policies or reduce taxes. We can't do any of those things. But one thing we can do is improve our own lives. 
um, and seek to live a better life and inspire others to do the same. So in a sense, this book actually speaks to that. And on this topic, actually, um, I was reading, I spent a good part of uh, this morning pouring through a marvelous book by Auburn Herbert. He was a very interesting British MP in um, the late 19th century and a beautiful writer. The, the name of the book is, that I just put it up on fee.org, is called um, uh, The Right and Wrong of Compulsion by the State. And uh, I, I mean, I feel like in reading him that I've truly found my muse. I mean, I, 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 I've rarely read a writer where in sentence after sentence for pages and pages and for a whole book of 350 pages, you know, I had, I had some sense of like nodding, you know, at every step, like, yes, oh, that's it. You got it. Oh, go, you go, man. You know, let's, let's get it. You know, that's exactly right. Um, I learned from him too, but um, mostly I just found myself in just like thoroughgoing agreement with, with, with the prose, with the, with the spirit, with, with the um, uh, humane values uh, and, and ethics and, and radicalism and, uh, and and even all the way down to the applications, I found myself just just going nuts. Just how how wonderful and beautiful this this book is. I, 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 maybe every other libertarian's already read this book, uh, the right and wrong compulsion by the state, and it's just something that you do when you you know become a libertarian or something. But I don't I don't really know. Um, but for me, I had never read it before. It's my first real full exposure. So it was really exciting to encounter this book for the first time. Um, but at some point, I wish I should have found this, found this quote for you. He, he does discuss this issue of like how we're going to change the world because he lived in a, in a world of rising socialism um, where the German system of Bismarckian welfare, warfare, statism was, was, was encroaching on England and, and there were ever more bureaucrats and statesmen legislating policies like poor laws and nationalized education, nationalized industry and uh, keeping up the colonial empire and, you know, and uh, uh, managing, you know, Ireland from a distance and so on. And um, it was a sort of a grim time for individual liberty, uh, especially old-fashioned English Englishmen who, who, who look back to the age of laissez-faire. So uh, he condemned it all, you know, in the course of the book. But there's this one sentence he says near the end. He's like, well, what are we going to do about this? You know, what's, what's up to you? And he says, basically, strive to live the best, freest, most wonderful, virtuous life you possibly can, never expecting anything from others um, that they don't want to give you or, or giving to anybody under compulsion, uh, just to live a life without compulsion, to live a life of volunteerism. And free choice is is the best way to change the world. And that was really an, a beautiful thing. It inspired me very much when I read that because I thought, you know, it's not funny that that um, you know, 120 years later, you know, Liberty Not Me gets founded with that explicit idea in mind that um, that that the best pathway towards freedom is improving your own life. Um, there's very little we can do about the system of government under which we live. We can we can decry it. We can we can scream. We can blog about it. We can post memes on Facebook, uh, write our congressmen, all the rest of it. In the end, we don't really have the power to change the system. Uh, the just system will be changed uh, from the inside, from the from the bottom up, starting in our own lives. And so, as libertarians, you could actually argue that our primary obligation is not just to be right on the issues, but um, but to reform our own uh, lives and our world in which we live to accord as much as possible with the ideals of freedom, um, which can be done. Uh, it takes creativity, but it can be done. So back to the book by Hazlitt, 1922. Uh, he sets out to write a kind of self-help manual for how to live a better life, how to achieve your goals, how to uh, get from here to there, and it's filled with all sorts of practical advice. I mean, I, I think it's tremendously insightful. I mean, I'm sad that Henry has that ever backed away from it because I think it's really, really good. So let me see if I can share some of the insights with you from this book. Okay, uh, by willpower, Hazlitt means our intellectual and character-based capacity for achieving our goals. Uh, that's all he means by willpower, the way to willpower. It doesn't mean exercising power uh, over others. He means exercising 
sort of control over yourself. Uh, uh, he calls it a character character based capacity for achieving our aims. We have aims. It's great, but how are we going to get from here to there? Um, he says this requires the syncing up of our choices and our goals. Um, what we do day to day with what is it what it is we want to achieve now that sounds easy enough and plain enough until you think about it um most people don't do this people have all sorts of goals for their lives that they don't actually uh, ever achieve because they don't live out the steps that are necessary to to get from here to there uh the the great example is that we want to be thin we want to be felt we want to be built we want to be we want to be good looking and have great bodies but we can't stop eating um you know, buckets of ice cream. Um, we join gyms. We don't. We don't. We don't go to them. We sleep in instead. Um, you know, we get a sweet tooth and run to the convenience store and you know, buy the place out. You know, of candy. Um, it's it's painful and difficult to to achieve that goal. Uh, you think of many other goals. I, I want to write an article, but I, I keep getting distracted by Netflix. Uh, I, I want to finish this book, but I keep uh, posting on Facebook and so on. I mean, there's I, and probably we've never lived in, in times with more uh, distractions from achieving our goals than we do now because there's just so much instantaneous and brand new things um, uh, that that we want to consume. So it, it, this becomes a you know a serious problem for us. I mean, you know, every few minutes, uh, my Twitter account is is lighting up with with new tweets. These days, since I just went on on Stossel to call for free immigration, most of the tweets that are coming into my tweet, Twitter account are unfortunately white nationalists, you know, denying me as a uh, as an advocate of white genocide and so on. I mean, I I I, I don't wish my life on you. I mean, it's it's actually. I mean, look, it's not a problem to ban Twitter accounts, but it, it but. Uh, that doesn't take any time at all, but but it's just depressing. It's just de depressing to be hammered by you know tweets like that. But anyway, yeah. So that's a distraction. Everything is a distraction to us these days. And that's sort of so sort of the goal of internet commerce is to take you away from doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing or that you want to do or that your goal is, and get you involved in things that really have nothing to do with your goal. I mean, that's that's the whole purpose of internet commerce is to get your attention and grab you away from other things. There's a, there's a book I've been trying to read recently. I think it's fundamentally fallacious. I think it's really wrong on, on um, measuring intangible goods. Um, and it's a very highly mathematical book, very complicated, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through it because I'm, I'm interested in the argument. I'm interested in, in, in this point of view because I, you know, ultimately I think it's wrong and I want to be able to cr critique it competently. Uh, but it's it's a painful read. I mean, it's not just uh, wrong-headed, but it it uh, it's super complex and super dense and uh, difficult. So I mean, there's a million other things I'd rather be doing uh, than doing that. So I keep getting distracted, you know, and and doing other things. This is this is an evidence of a lack of willpower. You have to decide what it is you want to do, and being able to uh, take the discrete steps that are necessary to get there. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, think of how many people want to be rich but can't get out of bed on time. Um, look at what happens to New Year's resolutions. You know, uh, 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 a few weeks or even a few days in, you know, they're gone. Oh, I'm not going to drink anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every time a person wakes up with a hangover, I'm not going to drink anymore. Um, or I'm going to go a week without drinking. I'm going to I'm going to go on a month long uh, uh, purge of alcohol or cigarettes or what you know whatever it is your vice. And then later in the day, suddenly things change. So he, he he begins his book with a dramatic claim that there's no will that's independent of desire, and that desire itself is the driving force of the choices that we make, um, minute to minute, hour by hour, day to day. Uh, the key to obtaining willpower is to master your desire. Uh, the, the desires need to be cultivated and shaped with intelligence and deliberation so that we can make choices consistent with our goals. So in order to master this, we have to recognize a crucially important feature of all action. And this is a point that he drew from the economics literature that he was reading at the time. No desire in this world can be obtained save the sacrifice of some other desires. Everything you want to do or everything you do do comes at some expense of something else. 
Desire leads to choice and every choice has a cost. The cost is that which you forego in the course of taking the steps necessary to achieve your goals. So I wanted to read this book, this, this complicated book. Um, I've been having a hard time doing it because um, uh, um, I keep getting distracted by Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it. Um, but the, you know, the cost, here, here's what you've got to think of it as like a, the cost of checking your Twitter account all the time is the book that you wanted to read that you're not reading. So that's the price you pay. And if you come to me and say, um, you say, uh, would you would you be willing to pay, would give up for reading this wonderful book in exchange for checking your Twitter account uh, 10 times in the last uh, two hours? Uh, I would say, no, that's a dumb choice. I want to read the book. Well, so why do I keep going back to my Twitter account? It's because I'm insufficiently aware of the opportunity cost for engaging my actions. Every action, every act, everything you're doing right now has a cost, and that cost is that which you would otherwise be doing were you not doing the thing you're doing. That's, that's, that's the cost. Uh, that's what you're paying. Um, anytime you, you take a nap, um, instead of going running, you're, 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 you're spending, in a sense, your, your, your health in exchange for which you get um, a sort of a lazy Sunday afternoon and so on. So this is the opportunity cost idea. He got it from reading his economics literature and he realized that a lot of, a lot of people's lack of self-control, lack of self-discipline and willpower, as he puts it, really comes down to their inability to, to have a proper uh, cognition of the reality of opportunity costs. People think they can do everything and anything they want. It's not true. We all have limited time. Whatever you're doing, uh, the cost for, for doing that is something else. So you're watching me right now. The cost for you're watching and listening to me is whatever you would otherwise be doing, um, watching Netflix or, or doing something else. So the, to be aware of that is to is to, is the first step to making good choices in life. Um, so in all, in all of our minds, we rank our preferences on a value scale. Um, what you're doing right now is evidently your number one choice. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. But the cost of that choice for number one is always number two. It's the thing you would otherwise be doing. It's a hard reality and something very uh, difficult to come to terms with that every choice we make has a trade-off. Um, and we need to know what we're giving up in order to make wise choices uh, and consider whether or not we're willing to pay that price and, and bring those into a, a court on, on a rational basis. So he writes, and I'm quoting him, the price of staying out late is sleep, health, efficiency of business, money, and self-improvement. That is, these are the things that a man must pay, lose, sacrifice, in order that he may stay out late. Conversely, the price of sleep, health, efficiency of business, money, and self-improvement is the pleasure that we would otherwise get from staying out late at night um and clowning around or whatever we're doing so uh and there's nothing wrong with with either choice you make so long as you are aware of the realities that staying out late comes at the expense of of uh, sleep and efficiency and you know the next day at work um so if your goal is to do really well at work you need to bring your uh, actions in line with your goals and recognize that you're paying a price for every choice you make, um, for everything you do that contradicts that goal. Okay, that's the first dimension. Um, to consider the full range of choices and the opportunity cost of your actions, not just what you're doing, but what you're, what you're giving up to do the thing you're doing and asking whether or not that's worth the price. This is the first uh, consideration to gaining willpower to be, have a cognizance of the reality of opportunity cost. Um, you know, if you wanted to go back to this analogy with economics one lesson, this is sort of considering the, um, uh, the effect on one group rather than all groups, right? So you consider the joy of whatever you're doing without a proper awareness of um, the thing you're giving up that might actually bring you greater joy in the, uh, uh, because it's, 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 it's part of your goal. The second dimension involves time. 
most of all of our goals in life are connected to something remote in time. We want we want to read the classics and travel the world, uh, obtain professional success, you know, finish school. Um, you know, read. I want to read this book. I want to write a critique of the book. Um, I mean, even in my case, I have to. I'm thinking about this mainly because I'm speaking this this Friday at Google, um, Google headquarters, which I'm really excited about this this gig, and I have to be I have to be awesome. I have to be wonderful. So I, I want to cram and and uh, be be the best I can be. Um, but most of the goals we we have are sort of remote goals. You ever notice that? We rarely wake up in the morning and say, "What are my goals?" And my goal is to eat breakfast. Oh, that's easy. Okay, that's just walking in and getting it done. My goal is to drink a cup of coffee. No, most of our goals involve things that were somehow um, not done yet. And the reason we haven't done them yet is that the goal is always remote in time. It's 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 out there. It, it's it's something that's going to take a week or a month or years. Um, uh, the problem is that we oftentimes sacrifice our goals for shorter term desires. You know, instead of Instead of reading the book, you know, I'm going to be uh, checking Twitter. Uh, getting thin is something that uh, can only happen through months of, of disciplined work. But um, eat, but uh, but uh, eating a gigantic breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner, complete with milkshakes at every step, is something that's more delightful in the immediate term. But the problem is that it comes at the expense of the long-term goal. Uh, the action and goal in this case are are incompatible. The actions of, of, that you're taking each moment of the day are incompatible with your long-term goals. So uh, his second uh, advice here is that willpower involves coordinating our short-term actions with our long-term goals. Whatever we're doing at the, at the time we're doing it uh, should accord with what it is we want to get done in two months. So if we want to, we want to lose, lose, lose weight um, uh, in, in time for, for the spring, uh, we need to start, um, uh, you know, and and make sure that everything we do along the way fits with that goal. Um, there's always a, a time trade-off here. You have to sacrifice now for what uh, can be obtained later. Um, you know, it's, it, this involves thinking not just about the immediate opportunity cost of your choices, but the later ones as well. If I keep doing this, I'm not going to obtain my goals. So part of Willpower involves making sure that whatever you're doing at that moment fits with your long-term goal. I mean, there's never a point at which in your day uh, or any any day which you're not actually working actively to achieving that goal. I want to read the collective works of Ayn Rand, but I keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. My goals just become uh, just worthless relative to the choices that I'm making day to day. So this is his basic model. Uh, be aware of the opportunity cost of all your actions, uh, not just you know just your immediate immediate tan tangible things that you're doing and and the delight that comes with them, but the costs that come from enjoying that tangibility, that tangible uh, delight, um, is the thing you're foregoing. Okay, that's number one. Number two is to always be aware that whatever you do in the short term must accord with your long term goals. And there's no sense in having a long term goal that you're not working every day to achieve. And this is what basically subverts all willpower. And he's right about this. I mean, as soon as I read this, I thought, well, yeah, of course, that's exactly it. People always have big, uh, big goals for their lives. Um, the problem comes in, in, in actually living day to day to achieve those goals. And the problem in trying to live every day to achieve those goals is that we're not quite aware of the opportunity costs of our actions. We, we tend to waste tons of time uh, doing things that are incompatible with our goals and we're weirdly sort of un, unaware of it. So having presented this basic model, uh, has it goes ahead and gives a series of pieces of, of, of discrete pieces of advice for um, how to get from here to there. First he says, we should never, we need to be very careful about forming our, our goals, you know, the goals that we have in mind. Um, it's, it's a stupid idea for me, for example, to have a goal of getting younger. I'm not going to get younger. That's not going to happen. It's a dumb goal. It can't, it's unobtainable, right? <laughs> so whatever your goal is, it has to be sort of, a, sort of ob obtainable. He says that you should never form goals in the midst of regret. Um, when, when you have a, a great, great regret of something you just did, um, 
that uh, we often, you know, we're like, I, I drank too much last night. Um, uh, the, I slept the day away. Um, I, 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 I let my friends talk me into going out bar hopping and, and got it for you, got it, got in at 4 a.m. And, and now I'm a, a, a disaster at the office. Uh, and so you form a goal. And my goal is to not do that anymore. But he says that goals formed in the midst of regret rarely actually last. It's always easier to desire a future of sobriety in the midst of a hangover. Or another example he gets is to desire to be thin once you've finished a huge meal. I've, I've had this happen to me many times. You know, you eat a gigantic meal and you think, oh, God, I regret that. That was terrible. I don't want to do that anymore. From now on, I'm going to just eat fish and vegetables and rice. You know, well, that goes away, you know, uh, six hours, so certainly by the next day. So, and, and, and the habit of making goals that you don't actually um, fulfill is a very bad one. So just don't make your goals in the midst of regret. Right? You just, I mean, you know, if something bad happens to you, just to just say, oh, that was, that was stupid, and, and move on. If you decide to have a goal of getting thin or going to bed early or whatever, make that not in the midst of your your, your sense of regret, but once that feeling of um, that overwhelming feeling of having made a mistake sort of passes, then you can make a more rational judgment about it. Um, Hazlitt further advises not to make a, a lots of different resolutions. You should make very uh, few resolutions for your life, and you should never make them out of disgust or passion, but rather resolutions should be should be realizable and rational uh, with with careful thought. Uh, never forget that obtaining goals gives involves giving up easier paths instead of choosing the more difficult route. Um, and when you're forming your goals, you should always uh, consider the price of your ambitions and never make the price too high. Um, uh, you know, people, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, I used to get these comic books that always advertised that I could look like Charles Atlas, you know, I'm looking at this muscular, amazing man in the comic book. And my goal is to become like that. I spend the money thinking that I could just sort of buy, buy that look. And it's preposterous. Um, that's that's not a realizable and, and rational rational goal. Um, we shouldn't make too many resolutions. We should make just a handful so that they're really achievable and never out of disgust or, or out of passion, but uh, out of out of rationality. And never make the price too high. Um, uh, the price of studying is giving up uh, giving up a night of partying. The price of professional accomplishment might be to easy go easy on the drink or forego Netflix or whatever. These are reasonable sacrifices, things that are obtainable through uh, discrete choices uh, that are not so painful they can actually uh, be achieved. The price must be payable or else your ambition to achieve the goal actually dies. So ha has it examines how our habits are really important to our self-mastery and achieving goals. So that's how you achieve goals. Well, how do you achieve the goal? He says that habit is the most important thing. Um, we all have habits to save us time and resources, how we tie our shoes, how we shave, how we put on our clothes. Um, work, too, can be a become a habit in the best possible way, if we handle it right, but only through nonstop repetition. Um, I once knew a man who uh, hated the fact that he uh, wasted the early mornings, all, all his early mornings, reading the newspaper rather than uh, growing wiser. So he made a goal of, um, of uh, it was a goal of a general goal was, was to become wiser. The discrete steps he would, he would do was to read um, Greek, uh, the Bible in Greek every morning um, or read uh, Shakespeare and examine uh, words and look them up in the Oxford English Dictionary and that sort of thing. This is a very old-fashioned guy. And so his way to achieve that was to uh, develop a habit that every morning he would get up and do this. And he would do it every day without, without exception. And he, he did it. And the more he did it, the more he just began to love it. And that, that habit just began to define his life. Um, 
I wrote an article recently for LifeSet about about getting in shape. This is a, this is you know we all want to get in shape, right? Um, the problem is we don't have the habits that lead to us getting into shape. So the the point is just to apply it, the Hazlitt's ideas here. Make your resolutions uh, small and achievable. Be aware of the cost and build in habits that help you achieve them. And the habit I've developed is that I get up every morning and do um, exercises right in uh, in my own uh, domestic environment. Uh, so. And I do this, and the way I force myself to do it is that I make um, uh, taking a shower and drinking a cup of coffee the reward I get for doing, you know, thirty squats, thirty push-ups, uh, uh, ten pull-ups, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is your your workout goals, and you do it every day. Then it becomes your habit, and then and then, um, if it is your habit, it, it gets easier and easier to adhere to it. Like the first time, it's, it's quite difficult. The second time, is difficult. But then if you keep it up for like a week or two, something begins to be a habit, and you stick, stick with it. Hazlitt writes, forming a new habit is like forging for yourself a new path in the words through stubborn underbrush and prickly thorns. While all the while, it's possible for you to take the well-worn, hard-trodden, pleasant path that already exists. Um, uh, so you can reflect on that. Uh, that every time you travel through the new path, you're going to tramp down more shrubbery and clear out more entanglements from the way. So it's hard to cut through. It's hard to break old habits and replace them with new habits. So be aware of that, but remember that it always gets easier uh, the more you do something. Uh, forming habits requires concentration. It's a learned skill and it's something you have to practice to feel uh, in order for it to become habitual. We need a program of work for daily achievement and we must stick to it no matter what becomes easier once our minds and bodies come to expect it. Um, now, in the course of all this, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's funny because when I first asked Murray to, to read this book and Murray Rothbard to read this book, look through it and tell me what it was about. This is before I had actually read the book. <clears throat> I knew it had existed, but I figured it was in Murray's library. I sure enough was. But Murray seized on about this book was he loved Hazlitt's critique of of the popular version of Freudian psychology. He thought it was really devastating and really wonderful. Um, uh, now, Hazza makes all of the, the proper caveats in this section. Now, he, he was, um, you know, he doesn't criticize Freud directly. What he criticizes is the way Freud came to be rendered in, 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 in the popular mind. I've recently spent a lot of time reading Freud and I'm, I'm just completely in awe of his insight. I think I think he was just a genius, really, a very careful scholar and an amazing visionary. Um, uh, and people say, "Oh, Freud's been refuted." Well, I mean, you can't say that because there's just too much Freud. There's too much wonderful stuff in there. You can't just dismiss it. I mean, it's just it's just nonstop insight. I mean, you can download his books from EPUB and on on EPUB from um, from uh, Gutenberg. And, and find some great stuff on group psychology and the history of the totem and just uh, there's a tremendous amount of insight. But nonetheless, in the 1920s, when Hazlitt was writing this book, all of Freud came to be rendered as a theory of the subconscious. And that's not entirely inaccurate. I mean, Freud did innovate uh, this realm of the subconscious. Uh, the realm of the subconscious is something that um, um, is it, it, very interesting. It was something that that, that uh, had never been thought of really uh, so ex explicitly. Um, in the past, it was always assumed that that all behavior was either um, was was either um, a, 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 a choice that that we we are we are setting out to make, and and therefore informed by moral considerations. Or it was uh, uh, completely involuntary and, in that sense, dictated by biological reality. Uh, what Freud did was carve out a kind of a third option, which is that we have in us a subconscious that informs our choices uh, that we're not entirely aware of and sometimes can't entirely control. But it's not rooted in a kind of physical malady. So it's, it's a third type of thing. The, um, Mises discusses this in, in socialism or somewhere. I'm not sure if it was in socialism. 
No, no, it wasn't in socialism. It was a series of lectures he gave in the 1950s at the San Francisco Public Library. And Harold's um, uh, Freud's insight here because he thought it was particularly humane. In the past, people who uh, behaved in, in odd and peculiar ways that were not in accord with how society expected them to were either considered immoral or you know, degenerate or uh, having a physical malady. So the only choice was to send them to the, to the, to, to the priest or you know, to, for moral reform or to cut them open and hack away their organs you know, or give them lobotomies or whatever. Um, Freudian, Freudian uh, uh, theory of, of the subconscious made it possible to think that there might be a third and much more humane way of, of dealing with, with um, abnormal psychology. So in that sense, Hazlitt, or Mises really loved Freud. And it's not that Hazlitt doesn't love Freud, but he worries that the theory of the subconscious um, is, contradicts our, our self-mastery. That, that it makes it too easy for us to excuse our behavior as a as not a consequence of our choice, but some deep uncontrollable you know urge within us that just makes us be this way. Um, uh, wrongly understood, uh, Freudian uh, psychology can be used as a as a kind of an excuse for a lack of of self mastery and self control. You know, so we began to come to believe that we're hopelessly victimized by our subconscious. You know, like, yeah, you know, what am I? What am I gonna do? You know, <clears throat> um, this stuff's too deep for me to control. It's just something that has to happen. Um, uh, and and he and Hazlitt says that this is only true if we come to believe it's true. I mean, if the subconscious is truly subconscious, right? We can't actually be conscious of it. So to to be conscious of our subconscious is is sort of a Sort of a, a, a contradiction at some at some level, um, especially if we're, we're conscious of it to the point that we're actually blaming our subconscious for our, our lack of self mastery and and um, self control. Hazlitt goes further to say that we actually have more mental resources than we're aware of. We so often limit ourselves. Now, I believe this. Um, um, you know, starting liberty dot me. Uh, was, was truly the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. You know, I feel like I'm a, I'm a hard worker. I've, 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 I feel like I've achieved many things. Um, but when, you, when, you're, when you're faced with something like a startup um, that asks of you, you know, two, three, five, ten times, twenty times the amount of mental, uh, physical, and intellectual uh, resources, a level of stamina you've never thought you could ever uh, provide to a, to a project, which is what Liberty Out Me required of me. Um, it's an awesome thing. You suddenly discover new resources that are inside of you. You didn't know where they're. The mind is a very, very powerful thing. Um, and and I think it's you know generally true as a cliche. It says that we only use a, a tiny fraction of it. That we all have more resources. We can always apply ourselves more than we currently are. Um, Hazlitt talks about uh, you know, this, this, this in popular language, the idea of a second wind or a third wind, he says that they really do exist, but we have to push hard to, to release them. Um, he says that a, a major part of, of finding those new resources within ourselves comes down to whether or not it's something we really uh, like to do. He tells funny stories about, um, you know, the man who, uh, his wife wants him to beat the carpets, but he's too exhausted to do it. Then his friend calls and wants him to come play poker, and he suddenly, you know, bounds out of bed, and he's he's got something extremely important to do. You know, uh, the difference is that we we somehow lack the energy to do the things we don't want to do, and then we find the energy to do the things we want don't that we do want to do. So how do we deal with this? Has it has the answer? His 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 answer is that we have to fall in love with work. Um, this is how great geniuses and great artists do amazing things with their lives. They come to treat work as play. Um, for example, they never worry about working too much um, or being too dedicated to their vocations. Uh, we have this myth of the workaholic. You always read on popular culture. Oh, you're a workaholic. That's the worst thing you can be. Not really. Um, as far as he's concerned, you know, workaholic is, is somebody who's fallen in love with his work, and that's a, that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Um, I'm sorry, I just got a message. <clears throat> you know, 
I have the opposite problem. I love work so much that I have a hard time um, letting it go for vacations. So what I finally learned to do was to treat my vacations and my my downtime as as work. So that that actually turned out well for me. So if I had to if I had to do a you know vacation, um, uh, you know like Christmas or or, or Easter or Thanksgiving and you know that kind of thing or just you know the usual you know two weeks here or there. Um, I always found it really painful and difficult mm-hmm. and until I learned to treat um, all all time off from from work as itself works. So I would throw myself into vacationing as if it were a job. That's a little bit of a mind game, but it it, it did work for me. It, 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 it was it was fantastic. It actually and I always have to remember, like consciously, to treat all things I do as work, and then I just love everything I do because I love work so much. Um, Hazla concludes with a, a beautiful sort of warning that um, that in the course of life, uh, whether it's learning new things or doing new things or uh, undertaking new uh, activities or, or or deploying newfound willpower. Uh, having gone through these steps that he's talking about, that we should should never forget the importance of moral courage. Um, moral courage is 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 essential to our lives because it's the easiest thing in the world to kind of stick to the routine, to go along with other, what other people uh, are doing, to only think the thoughts that other people say you should think, um, to not think a new way, to not embark upon a new and radical path. Um, that's always the easiest thing to do. To depart from the path uh, requires a kind of a courage, uh, the virtue to step out on your own and stick by your convictions. And I'll, I'll close here my discussion of, of Hazel's book with this quote. One must have the courage to go where the mind leads, no matter how startling the conclusion, how shattering, how much it may hurt oneself or a particular class, no matter how unfashionable or how obnoxious it may seem at first, it may require the courage to stand against the whole world. Great is the man who has that courage, for he has indeed achieved willpower. So Hazlitt ends on a kind of a moral message. Um, uh, you know, there is no there is no willpower outside, uh, you know, a, a, a dedicated moral courage. Um, very beautiful message. I mean, Hazlitt himself exercised it in his life. And this is another thing I like to think, and why this book has a lot of credibility to me. Uh, and in his, he was in his very later years, I met Hazlitt, and I said, uh, I said, you know, because, I mean, this is a guy who wrote two to three New York Times editorials for, for 12 years at the time he, he, he worked there. He never seemed to be short of ideas. When he <coughs> ran American, American Mercury for H, after H. L. Lincoln's death, uh, I never stopped turning out copy when he worked for the New York Sun in the 1920s. He was amazing when he worked for the nation in the 1930s. He never stopped writing um, book reviews. He was a literary editor. I mean, this guy uh, just worked, worked so hard all of his life. Just, I mean, if you put all of his, the words he wrote together into uh, volumes, I'm sure it would be, you know, it would be a shelf of, of books um, of four, feet, four feet wide, maybe five feet wide. Uh, collected works, probably 30 volumes or something, it's just, or 50 volumes or something. The guy was unbelievable. In addition to writing a full scale critique of, of Keynes and, and uh, uh, publishing a collection of the Stoics, the economics of my lesson was just, it was nothing for him. It took him 10 days. He had an awesome work ethic, awesome. And I asked him, um, I said, I said, um, Mr. Hazard, did you, did, was there ever a time in your life when you got writer's block? And he said, writer's block? I don't, he said, I, 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 how can I have writer's block? I was a writer. Um, I didn't have writer's block um, ever because that's what my job was. It's just like if you're a bicyclist, you know, and that's your sport, then you don't get the bicycle block. You just keep pedaling. And so that's why he looked at it. He just never stopped riding. Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, uh, the Freeman. This guy was an amazing, amazing man. Incredible productivity. One of the things I really like about him as a writer, and I try to think of this uh, this way too. Don't think of writing as taking something out of you. Think of it as just something you do. So when you finish an article, 
take a bunch of next article um, and push it out. And then when you're done with that one, think about your next article and push it out. Never stop doing that. You know, don't think of it as like, you know, don't put laurel leaves on your head and congratulate yourself or think of yourself as having been sucked dry. Uh, there's an endless font of ideas in your mind. You should, you should uh, uh, have confidence in that. You have to believe that or else you will run out of ideas. If you think there's a scarcity and a shortage of, of work time, workspace in, in your body and in your mind, yeah, it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you remember that ideas are infinite, they're flowing like a river, they never stop. And your job is just to, uh, just to push the keys and, and get them out there. Then you never stop writing. And never look back with a sense of, uh, of uh, wow, what an awesome accomplishment. Um, now I'm exhausted. Now I'm going to take a break. No, oh, forget it. You know, whatever you've done in the past, forget it. It's, it's done. It's over. Think about what you're going to do in the future and never, and, and never stop working. Um, ne never, uh, uh, and never feel yourself to be exhausted. The first thought, I, this is one of my, I, I love this book because I mean, it sort of accords with a lot of things that I, I think. Um, some years ago, I noticed it became very common for people to, to always say, I'm tired. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm tired. How are you? I am really tired. Wow, am I tired? I'm tired. Yeah, have you heard this? I mean, people say this all the time. I mean, once you become aware of it, how many people say that they're tired all the time? I mean, it's actually annoying. Uh, how often, maybe you say it, I don't know. I, I, I block those two words from my vocabulary. I never say I'm tired because the instant you say it, I mean, even the phrase itself makes you tired. If you stop saying it, maybe you won't be tired. Uh, it's just, I don't know. I don't know when this came about where people are just so um, announced that they're tired, um, uh, you know, and feel like that's a great excuse for, 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 for not doing anything. This is a great evidence of the absence of willpower, actually, to always discover that you're tired. If you stop discovering that you're tired, you won't be tired. Uh, you're not tired anyway. You're not tired. Just keep, keep working. Keep doing the thing. Never get tired. It's just dumb. Um, and if you are tired, okay, collapse. But don't say it. Don't say it out loud. Because the more you say it, the more it just becomes absolutely true. You announce. It's like you're putting a sticker on your forehead, tired guy, you know, and then you become worthless. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hazel was never tired. He was glad for every day, every minute of life, just to keep working, keep accomplishing things. And he lived, I think, to be 100 hundred years old or something, uh, something along those lines. And it was an awesome thing. He was an amazing man. And look how much he did for the world. Uh, he never reflected on it, never looked back. He was always looked forward. What's his next article, his next thought? There's something about that, you know? I mean, there's something, there's something awesome about that, that kind of, uh, what used to be called a work ethic, really. Um, and this book is a great tribute to the work ethic and why it's the very essence of life, accomplishing things, doing things. Um, making valuable things, creating value, using all of your mental and intellectual uh, physical resources to be the best person you can be, um, being aware that you must always bring into line what you're doing right now with what your goals are and to consider um, your goals and discrete steps, make sure they're achievable and, and they're not uh, going to cost you too much. And remember that, that the cost of whatever you're doing right now is the thing you would otherwise be doing. And, and once you get the system worked out in your mind and, and you have good goals and a good uh, path to achieving those goals, um, then you have willpower and your life begins to be awesome, awesome and epic and you live a valuable and beautiful life. And that's, that's the way how that tells the story. So I am sure there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of other books that that uh, cover the same same area as this book. But I and I, I don't know if that's true or not because I'm not well read in this literature. But I love this book for that reason. Um, first of all, it's by one of my favorite authors, one of my personal heroes, and he's speaking to me. You know, he's speaking about a subject that really that that matters, and 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 and, and so doing. It takes away, in a sense, the stigma of of self self help books. You know, people think that you know by buying a self help book, it's like an admission that you're a shabby person. You know, not true. 
We all need life coaching. This book is an ex excellent manual for life coaching. There may be something better, you know, I don't know, but I love this one. Uh, um, it, it, it delighted me, you know, at every step. So good for good for Hazlitt. It was the second book to ever get published. I forget now what the first one was. Oh, this first one was about was about um, thinking as a science, which is also a wonderful book. Maybe we should cover that one some night. This was the second book and the one he wanted to forget about, but he's wrong. This is a great book. I asked Hazlitt what his best book was. I said his best book was his book on ethics. It's called uh, um, Foundations of Morality. Well, this is also his least read book, right? You know, and I said, what about Economics One Lesson? He said, that's my least favorite book. You know, authors themselves don't know. I mean, it's like me, you know, I, I, my favorite book that I've ever, I've ever put together is A Beautiful Anarchy. Um, I love that book. But of course, it's, it's, it's bourbon for breakfast that, that, uh, that I, I guess will, I'll, I'll be known for for the rest of my life. You know, that's, that authors aren't, uh, oftentimes aren't the best judge of their own work. In any case, let me check the chat window now before I, I finish this off with mine. Um, okay, I I don't actually have that particular chat window open. It's a peculiar feature of this Google Hangouts that I can't actually look at the chat window at the same time that I'm in this thing. So we'll just call it a night. And um, I urge you to download the book. It's a quick read. You can read it tonight um, and maybe finish it over lunch tomorrow. And who knows? It might inspire you. I've recommended it to many people who absolutely love it. So. Thank you so much for being a member of Liberty.me, for doing your part to make the world a freer place by um, making your own life freer. And I, I would say this book is an essential part of that. At least it's something I, I would recommend to you. What else is going on this week? Well, uh, we had the Republican debate last week. That's been a great fodder for commentary and, and talk, and I've written plenty of it. Um, it's been a fascinating thing. I sat through all three hours of it. You talk about paying a, a big price. Oh, my goodness. Uh, what else I could have been doing during that time? That Maybe that was a, a bad goal. <laughs> I don't know if it, but I feel robbed afterwards. Oh, it was exa absolutely exhausting, Rel especially relative to what I was able to actually crank out about it, which was not that much. Um, um, I... Uh, in my own in my own life, I was I was on Stossel this past week arguing for open borders. That was a very interesting thing, because um, um, just just to, to tell you how these things happen, I was I was at Freedom Fest and I and I got up in front of a crowd and said, I don't I don't think there should be any borders. People should be free migration of all peoples everywhere, um, actually, and that should be the ideal. And, and uh, we live in a, in, a, in a time where the nation state is increasingly anachronistic. The purpose, the original purpose of borders was to restrain the jurisdiction of the state, not to create prison states where they kept everybody in and kept everybody out. I mean, this is, this is no different from uh, protectionism. It's, it's a path to massive economic inefficiency. Well, my comments are, are at live comments at Freedom Fest was what got me invited on to Stossel. So I accepted the gig, and it was great for me because I didn't, it was not all that well schooled on the subject. So I had to do a, like a crash course that lasted about a week on the subject of, of immigration and the particulars of, of US immigration policy. And I learned all sorts of things I had no idea. I had no idea that virtually, you know, immigration was virtually banned and that this ban has led to a massive influx of illegals in the same sense that prohibition led to, to bootleggers. I mean, it's just what you expect. You can't seal the border, there's no chance of it. But if you look at the data of immigrants, you find that they receive less welfare, they're less criminally inclined, they start uh, uh, businesses at twice the rate of, of natives, and, and so on. I was just, and 95% of, of immigrant households have, have somebody working within, within them with a, with a job. And I realized other things that, which I hadn't entirely thought about before, that uh, immigration restrictions are a violation of two people's rights, the person who wants a job and the person who wants to hire the person who wants a job. And that you and I finally concluded that my goodness, if you have any immigration controls, you're going to have uh, a total state because because you can't easily discern the difference between immigrants and non um, and, uh, natives. So you have to investigate every business and indeed every household in America with a massive surveillance state to stop it. And that a consistent form of immigration control would necessarily lead to a totalitarian society. And you know, and and indeed, we we see that that's exactly what's happened in the U.S. 
So thinking through all these things was an amazing thing for me, a wonderful opportunity. And there's nothing like having to go on live television uh, to talk in front of a live audience and broadcast all over the planet to impress upon you the importance of learning about a subject. So I threw myself into a subject that I, I had, I think I had some ambiguity about in the past, or I was, t you know, I had a free immigration position at one point and then I kind of shelved it. Um, and I hadn't really thought that much about it. So I was grateful for this opportunity to learn, learn a topic um, that I hadn't really uh, thought, thought in depth about it. It's our minds are funny. We, we, um, uh, we decide what we want to think seriously about and what we just don't want to think about. Um, and it takes, you know, lack of a better term, willpower to set out or an incentive to set out and, and learn something completely new. So it was really an exciting intellectual journey for me. And I feel very convicted about the issue. I'm actually, people are urging me now to write a book about the subject, which I very well might. Um, I feel like I've changed some minds. I know that I changed my own mind on the subject a little bit, at least firmed up what I think was a, a nascent uh, opinion I once had. Um, so that was very exciting. This next week, I, I'm, I'm doing something that I never thought I would do, which is I'm going to Google headquarters and giving a, a speech. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the economic challenge of commerce on the internet and what are the theoretical and practical implications of that. So I have to be awesome at that, to say the least. And then I'm very honored to be speaking to Silicon Valley at the Mises celebration, where I think I'm going to be talking about the relevance of Mises and his theories in a digital age. And I get to I get to examine what Mises said about ideas and, and why they matter. Um, so that's going to be a really fun evening. Really looking forward to that uh, too. Um, so that's my week. I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, I look forward to seeing you. I think next Sunday I'll be back in time. So I look forward to visiting with you then. Thanks, and I'll see you online. All the best to you. Take care.